<laughs> yeah, that's what you got to do. Ah, <laughs> uh, all right. So good Patreon. I like it. Yeah. Ready to do the damn thing? Let's do it. Yeah. You don't want to talk about what I was talking about before the Patreon? Oh, what were we talking about before the Patreon? Never mind. Oh no, no, that thing? No, no, no. We can't. We can't ever. <laughs> we've all agreed. <laughs> the vow of silence begins now. From fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada, this is Pod Therapy. Real people, real problems, and real therapists. You can submit your questions anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. Check out the Patreon version of the show if you like sports ball, and even if you don't, check it out. And you get to hear Jim's story about swallowing a baby weasel. <laughs> and now, broadcasting from the churn, that guy is Dim, D- Dr. Jim. Dim, B- Jim MD. Baby weasel Jobin. <laughs> I'm Nick Tangerman. It's time for some pot therapy. Uh, come check us out. Patreon.com slash therapy. Haven't been plugging it enough, but there has been a lot of extra content that we've been throwing up in September. And some of it's been okay. I, some I of it's would, damn good. I would argue that we've actually plugged it too much. Oh, okay. So go down to Patreon.com slash therapy. You know Listen why. to lectures on narcissistic personality disorder, imposter syndrome, and childhood trauma, and even take an assessment and yeah. see about how childhood trauma can affect your life. That's not why. Okay, go on. We, I think we plugged we, it too much? Too much. Why? The expectations are too high? Nope. Okay. Because we really sold people on the idea of that of the content on the Patreon version of the show. Oh, this has always been a scam, and now, No, no, no. And now it drove Laura to a point <laughs> where she had to become a Patreon. <laughs> So now she gets the full version. Oh, so, this is bad. This definitely happened. For new listeners, Laura is Nick's girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, we get to we. This is the show where we thank her. Yeah. This is the one where we acknowledge her. Yeah. So, oh, give me Laura's name. I feel like I should be the one to thank okay. Laura. It's right. Laura. Right. She only signed up as Laura. But oh my god! So I get a notification every time we get a new Patreon because we get an email. And usually I'll be the one to, to notice it first and get on Twitter and thank the person or whatever or Nick does. It's, whoever sees it first just does it. And so it was in the morning time, and I see Laura. And I at first I'm like, oh, there's a Laura who's subscribing to the show. That's great. And then I open up the email, and it shows me, like, the email address of the person. Yeah. And it's definitely your Laura. Like, I recognize this email <laughs> and address. And my stomach just sank. <laughs> <laughs> and so I immediately oh. text Nick and I go, if you want to end the show and destroy the archive, you say the word. I am ready. I am willing to do this for you. It's okay. I completely understand <laughs> without asking the question why you waited until the main show started yeah. to mention this. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. So well, I think the best tweet was from Robert Paulson. What did he say? He was like, "Oh, great! Now she has access to the extra thirty to forty minutes of blank airtime oh, for the episodes." <laughs> he tried to bail yeah, us out. Like, he nice, was like, "I mean, I wouldn't nice. waste the dollar, but she can do what she wants." I nice guess. try. I don't think she bought it. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> He's trying to get us out of this. Yeah, I was ready to initiate self destruct. Unfortunately, she probably sees the other tweets and, and yeah, whatnot she did. instantly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there, there's a handful of humans in this world that if I suddenly see their name appear on that Patreon, I'm just burning the whole thing down. <laughs> the liability's way too high. What are their Twitter <laughs> handles? Yeah. Oh, shit, that's a board of director. <laughs> and delete. <laughs> that's a board of examiner. <laughs> Goodbye, show. <laughs> we don't need this shit anymore. Uh, come check it out. Patreon.com slash therapy. Unless oh, you're on the board of directors in Nevada. Unless you're on the board of directors <laughs> in Nevada. Come check it out. And uh, oh, it's funny because uh, there was one of the best advertisements I ever saw uh, was, for, <laughs> was for Pornhub. And it said, the world's largest archive of, quote, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> ah. What are you watching? Nothing. <laughs> It's like, oh, this is genius. Uh, so, yeah, uh, come down to patreon.com slash therapy and listen to 45 minutes of silence before the show. <laughs> Isn't Guaranteed. Pornhub the one that's like they, they take movies that have been banned, like movies and TV shows oh, that, that have been like scrubbed them. off yeah, and, yeah. and they just put them up on Pornhub? Yes. Yeah, I remember. Oh, really? Yeah. There was uh, season four, I think, of Rick and Morty. I was having trouble finding it. And I was talking to one of my brother in laws, and they was, he goes, Bro, Pornhub. <laughs> I was like, What? He's like, it's on there. You're kidding. <laughs> Pornhub just puts up anything and everything. Yeah, they just get away with it. Oh. Nobody's nobody's ratting them out. <laughs> like, if you found it on there, who are you going to tell? <laughs> you keep your mouth shut. That's what you do. 
<laughs> yeah. I've, I, it's weird because I've read, you'd think they would get cracked down on. Because yeah. I, I, I know this because I have read several articles about yeah. that. Yeah. Where they're like, oh, yeah. They, I'm they sure put, at like, some point it gets exposed. They put fucking like, uh, the, the one that I read about was like Pornhub for a while was the only place in the U.S. that you could find the Disney movie Song of the South. <laughs> really? Oh, that's right, because it's been banned on everything. Yeah. It's like Disney, Disney it. won't play it anywhere. Disney can't get them. Disney, Disney won't like admit that it exists. <laughs> they won't even send a season to assist. <gasps> I'll bet the Star Wars holiday special is probably on. Got it. It is. And now oh. when Laura catches you on it, you should be like, oh, no, no, no. This is, I was just Star Wars. I just really, Star Wars. So we got some great questions today. Uh, exciting stuff to dig into. We're leading off. Unfortunately, we don't have time for them because I'm looking at Pornhub. <laughs> <laughs> there was an old question about that. <laughs> Watching that when you're bored. First question is about workplace friendships. I don't believe I am someone who really demands respect. I am a supervisor and mainly leave my staff to do their own things as I trust them to do it. I will update or lay out any new expectations, but beyond that, I'm pretty hands-off. Within the past month, I feel like my staff are using leaving me out of the loop are, are leaving me out of the loop of things more and more. Or they will talk with me about something and I rarely hear any follow-up. I don't know what I did, but I feel like I've lost their respect, or at least a good deal of it. This kind of goes into my next issue about my job. I don't have friends, and barely have anyone I would, I would consider an acquaintance. I'll start to get really lonely when seeing most of the others hanging out in their downtime, and I've even heard most of the staff meeting up at a local bar. I've never been good at making friends, but it's getting almost unbearable seeing this stuff. Thanks, guys. Love the show. Anonymous. Okay. Yeah. A couple of things there. Workplace friendships. I've always had a hard time with workplace friendships. You may be the only workplace friend I've ever had, and I'm pretty sure you would object to that description. <laughs> Acquaintance, uh, comrade. We have kind of a Dolly House Wilson relationship. Yeah. That, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> One of you is yeah. a doctor, and yeah, one of you house. is a volleyball. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So all of the jobs I've ever, when I was a teacher, I didn't want to be friends with any of them. I, I had a really hard time, like, interacting with other teachers. I didn't like doing it. If if I was chit-chatty with them, it'd be really passive, just kind of, you know, work stuff. Like, oh, that thing's crazy. Bye. And and I would get invitations. People like, oh, you know, Jim, we're going to go to Applebee's. Or, and I just never wanted to do that. Like, it always felt weird to, to hang out with other people. Then when I became a therapist, same thing. I, I never wanted to interact with other therapists or like hang out with them. And especially because in the beginning I worked at a rehab and it was weird to like go get a beer. And I, cause like, especially when you're colleagues, you don't know who's in recovery or who's not. So I just would err on the side of just never hanging out with anybody. Cause I didn't know what the rules would be. And then you and I worked side by side at dual success. And that was the first time I ever hung out with a colleague, but I don't think we hung out socially for a long time, we would go get lunch. And then yeah. we started playing fantasy football and, and goofing off and March Madness. We started making like little office bets. Mm -hmm. So we'd hang out like, in, but we were with each other all the time at the job. Yeah. So that was the first time I ever hung out with a friend. And then I went into solo practice. But then I was the boss at the other rehab. Couldn't be friends with anybody. You yes. know, like I relate to this guy because when you're the boss, you really can't be friends. That's really tricky. Yeah, and you probably shouldn't set the expectation that you're going to try to be friends. Yeah, but I get the loneliness. Yeah, no, totally. Yeah, and I think you can be friends with people that are kind of at the same uh, level on the hierarchy. Yeah. But it's really tough to be friends with somebody who you supervise. Yeah. So, like, Brian and I, when we worked together, Brian was back in the... Uh, Smart Goals episode. Smart Goals episode. Um. I mean, he and I, when I first moved to Vegas, uh, we were the only two men working in this program. We had probably 30-some employees. We had two guys. It oh, was wow. me and Brian. Yeah. So we were just kind of like, okay, well, we're just going to be friends because that's just... <laughs> this is it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If we can't get along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but then I became his supervisor at one point. Yeah. But it wasn't, it was a little bit different in that sense because we kind of had that relationship where I didn't, 
I didn't feel like I was a supervisor, and work. he was pretty independent. You know, yeah, like you could just give him stuff to do. I think it can work in, so, in healthcare. I think it often does work like that. I yeah. mean, to to an extent, like there's a tier of other professionals that you supervise that are already pretty independent. Like they yeah. do need to answer to you. You do have some sway over their life, but they're they're already providers. Like yeah. you're, they're not living and dying by what you want. You're running the organization yeah. really more yeah. than anything. And so I don't think it gets too weird. But again, I wouldn't want to pal around with them. Yeah. Well, and and I think for the writer, like, I wouldn't take it personally if you're not invited to some of these activities or some yeah, of these after yeah, work things. Yeah. Because it may not have anything to do with you as a person. It may have right. to do with you as in your position. Yes. You know, and so if they feel like they can't be themselves around you because you are their supervisor at work on Monday, then, you know... It, that's that may be why you don't get invited to stuff like that. So what do you think about when the writer says, I, I feel like maybe I'm losing their respect. Uh, and he pivots. The, the, I don't know what the gender of the writer, but the writer pivots quickly to talking about not being invited to things. And, and there's also a loneliness factor, but the writer kind of starts off by saying, Hey, I take it pretty seriously to do good at this. I'm pretty hands off. I don't badger people. You know, I give them a, 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 an easy way of things, but people are leaving me out of the loop on things. They're not following up with me about things, which sounds work related rather than personal. Mm -hmm. And the writer says, you know, I don't know. Am I, am I losing their respect? Writer, I don't, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm curious about that. I'd have follow-up questions. My first impression is, no, that's good. Like when your staff doesn't need to keep checking in with you about every little thing and they're just doing what you say and you're not requiring like to go back and revisit a topic multiple times, that just could be good leadership, right? It could be. I mean, but the other thing, too, is, I mean, obviously, it sounds like the writer wants to be included, wants to be in the loop. Wants follow up. But yeah. I think, I, I mean, from that, I don't really have a whole lot of feedback from the perspective of a clinician. Right. My feedback is more as somebody who's been a supervisor. Staff will do what they're trained to do, whether intentionally trained or inadvertently trained. Yeah. And somehow they, you've kind of created this culture in which they can operate independently and they don't need to include you. Right. Now, if that's something that you want, that's fine. But if you want to change that culture, then you have to intentionally create that change. Right. Uh, you have to actually go in there and you have to, you know, and, and uh, I realize you may not want uh, conflict and you don't have to do it in a, in a way that creates conflict, but you do need to set clear expectations. Yes. And you need to be consistent with those. Yes. That's the hardest part because it's really easy to set expectations about what you what you want from your staff. But then to be able to s reinforce that consistently, it yeah. takes time. Yeah, and it sounds like, writer, you're saying, you know, I feel left out of the loop. I feel like they're bringing up things, like going to a bar, and then they don't mention it to me, or I hear about social things, and then I'm dealt out of it. Don't take it personally. I mean, that's the reality of the boss, you know? Have you ever seen the show Brooklyn Nine-Nine on no. NBC? So they're I cops. I know of it, but I've never yeah. seen it. So I was watching it the other day, and there's an episode where all the detectives, the cops, they all go to this beach house for a, a long weekend. It's like this annual retreat they all do. And then they invite their sergeant, like or the boss, the chief or whatever of the precinct. And he's like this very stoic, you know, like yeah. buzzkill guy. And like he's there with them all weekend. And they're just like, so what are we going to do now? I'm like, no, no, it's going to be fine. We're just going to party and hang out. And they're like, that absolutely cannot happen. Like in his presence, that cannot happen. Even though he says he's not the boss when he's hanging out with us. It inherently is that, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you're not invited to things, writer, I think that's a big piece of it. Well, it almost kind of sounds like there's two pieces here. Because it seems like the first paragraph here really has to do with the the culture of the environment that that he's working in. Right. He or she is working in. The the uh, way that they've structured their leadership. Yeah. Um, and that I think I would really take a serious, serious look at. I, I agree with you, Jim, that I think the second paragraph here as far as not really fitting in i think you need to find friends probably outside of work i think you need to find activities that's your best bet honestly yeah that's where you're gonna find buddies and and i don't like to find work friends i don't like it because it would always compromise i would always feel that it changes my dynamic with whoever i was working with right 
And so, like, I would think, well, you know, at some point I could have to fire this person or whatever, and I don't want to have this conflict of interest, you know, kind of dynamic. I don't want them to feel it's artificial. Like, anything that they say or do to me, I'm going to feel, is it a manipulation? Is this somehow artificial? And I just didn't like that that duality. Mm -hmm. And so, for me, I would just keep it, you know, professional all the time. My my version of professional is still pretty jovial and, like, just kind of hanging out. You know, I don't try to walk around all stodgy. So usually it's pretty chill, but yeah. I mean, I would say go out, find social groups on your own. Don't take it personally. And remember, even in the military, writer, you know, officers dine with officers. Enlisted stay with enlisted. And they do that because they don't want to commingle these teams because they do have to exist on different tiers. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that's a thing. Yeah. Also showering. Showering separately. It's probably, don't no, shower I was gonna with say, your employees. I was going to say take showers. That helps. Because uh, certain odors yes, can uh, turn people find off that offensive. Of, uh, from inviting you to things. In the entertainment industry, there's probably not as much pressure to, like, stay to your own, right? Like, oh, directors only hang out with directors, and, you know, leaders only oh, hang out no, with Oh, no, no, not that. It's not like that, right? Because it's, it's just showbiz. Everybody's doing the same thing. Every, uh, yeah, for the most part, everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah, so they don't have that kind of delineation. There's also not a whole lot of, of power dynamic. Okay. That happens. Because everybody just has a job to do. Everybody's got a job. Yeah. I mean, there, there are people who have power, and those yeah. people kind of don't party with the... Okay. With, so there is a little else. bit of that. Uh, but it, but it's it's small. Okay. There's only a few people that have that much influence that they need and to And even at that sequester. point, like, there are still plenty of parties. Like, if the producer is throwing a party on a show, yeah. and everybody goes to it, Everybody's going to cut loose the same way that they would otherwise. Okay. Yeah, they're not worried about being judged. No, or seen I mean, show business, entertainment is its own. It's, it's, it's its it own is, animal. It is its own animal. Yeah, almost no other industry could I think of, especially in healthcare. I mean, you know, but that's interesting too. And like in everybody, healthcare, and, and it does everybody is having sex with everybody. Yeah, that's and, already and happening. Like, yeah, yeah. It's an it, eyes wide shut party. It, yeah, I mean. Not exactly, but not <laughs> give or take. Not not exactly, not that either. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go, writer. <laughs> Some solid entertainment advice. Yeah, but yeah, you know, I I would strongly recommend don't take it personally. Look for friendships outside of work. I think at your level, if you're the leader, sometimes that's the expectation you just have to live with, and and it's not always a bad thing. Let work be work, and try to look for friendship elsewhere. I think I do. I mean, I I've always like with romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. I have always said. I am a, a huge believer in the don't shit where you eat. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I don't want any kind of romantic relationship. I don't I don't want people that I work with to have any inkling whether or not I find them attractive. Right. You want a, a mm -hmm. wall. Like, like we can be friends, we can be buddies, we can hang out all the time outside of work. Right. But like there are certain barriers that I definitely keep up with people that I work with. Right. Even yeah. even today. Like you yeah. know people that I'm that I am close friends with. Yeah, that I see outside of work multiple times every week, I would say like, no, like we, we have that like, makes so much sense. I ha I have a coworker. You no, know, I've wondered why he's rebuffed all my affections. Yeah. Professionalism. I have a coworker right <laughs> That's now. That's it. That the I audio am, guy code. I am around. Uh, I'm I'm around her often mm -hmm. outside of work. Like she she and my wife are friends. I'm friends with her husband, and like we all we all hang out collectively mm -hmm. all the time. But because of that. Mm. Like she and I are together, and like, and people will see us leaving work together oh, and things right, like that. Right, right. And the other week, someone made a comment to me. And one thing is, she and her husband are a one car household. Oh, wow. Okay. And so there was one night, I don't know, like a week or two ago, maybe even longer, maybe a month ago, it doesn't matter. Uh, her husband had dropped her off at the show and had texted me, Hey, can do you mind uh, running my wife? By the house after after the show, and, sure. and you'll hang out hang out and have a drink or whatever if you right. want. But like, can Carpool. you can you get yeah. her to the house after the show? No problem. And so we we walk out together after the shows that night. The next day, a, another coworker of mine said, "Hey, saw you guys leaving last night. Oh, jeez, how's that going? Oh, wow." And I. I responded in a way that was too harsh for the situation. <laughs> okay, yeah. But yeah. not in a way that I regret anything that I said. It, it communicated clearly. That was this like... This will not be questioned again. Nope. Yeah. That is not something we are even going to broach. Yeah. I don't even want anything like that in yeah. the atmosphere. I will squash that right now. Yeah. 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 Like, Full nope. Stop. We are... We are not there is there is nothing happening. We are not attracted to each other in any way. We are friends. Our yeah. spouses are friends. We are all friends. Carpool. That's it. Keep this out of your mouth. Yeah. Yeah. 
put an end to it quickly. Because like, yeah. this shit can shut da- can oh, shut yeah. everything down. Oh yeah, yeah. you don't this, want yeah. that. This can yeah. fuck up personal life yeah. and work life. Don't joke yeah, about yeah. that kind of stuff. And yeah. like, nope, we are out. And so yeah, writer, I would say like, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Mm-hmm. To keep yeah. this separate completely. Yes. Yeah. Because if you are the boss, yeah. If it comes down to an evaluation, yep. a raise, yep. firing someone, yep. hiring someone. Mm-hmm. Yo, let's just say you're hiring somebody yeah. and one of your friends, yep. who is also your coworker, right, says, Hey, I've got, you know, my cousin it wants to apply for this job. Right. And then you don't hire Could their you do cousin. Me a, a favor. Yeah. You mean a lot to my family. And then you don't hire their cousin because right. someone is more qualified. more qualified. Yep. And it's just like, I can't hire your cousin. This other person is more qualified. Yep. We call those dual roles. Now you, you gotta deal them. with shit that you wouldn't have to deal with otherwise. Yep. It's yeah. easier to to go to your local bar, get on what's what's the website you always tell? Meetup.com. Meetup.com. Go on that. Go on fucking grinder. Find a friend on grinder. Sure. Who cares? Don't care. Do it your way. Find but you some friends somewhere else. It's very that's similar. That's not at work because it'll make your life simpler in the it long honestly run. Honestly, is but it's very similar to being a therapist. Well, and every How many patients have we thought, man, that'd be a great buddy. You know, sure. I'd love to hang out with them, and they'll say like, it'd be great if you could just come to the ball game with us or do something as a family. And like, I can't. You like, know, now, I can never do it. Well, and actually, I might go to the I ball game and it. I might see you across the way, and I might wave at you. Yeah, and that's going to be the extent of our interaction. I outside always tell of people here. I will not be the first to wave if you wave well, at yeah. me. I will that's, acknowledge you and say hi, and that's yeah. it, you know, but... But this actually privacy. reminds me, like, every supervisor... A lot of supervisors that I've had this experience with where I see them outside of work, mm-hmm. and I'm surprised at, like, wow, they're really outgoing outside of work, or they're oh, really yeah. interest like, like, oh, I would have never... Yeah. Guess that my supervisor would be doing that or right. something like that. People do that. Anytime, with, people at shows do that with me. Yeah. And constantly. every yeah. and every time I've had guy. that experience, it's always a supervisor who's a good supervisor. Yeah. Yeah. Because right. what they're demonstrating is a separation between yes. their work life yes. and their personal it's, life. Yeah. I'm here to go to so, work. Yep. When I'm yeah. when I'm not at work, I'm not at work. And you know yeah. what, Ryder? My last note on this. For me, not being invited to things, and this will sound dumb, but follow me on this, not being invited to things when I was a boss was actually a sign of respect, you know, because I was a young boss. I had a lot of employees that were much older than me. And so that was in some ways a sign of respect that, hey, we recognize that you're not our comrade. You're not just going to come pal around with us. We recognize that you're on a different tier. And it was just, it was fine. And I was good with not being invited. Yeah. And sometimes people would do it like as a nod. And I would make a joke like, oh, you know, I can't, whatever. Old man, you got to do things, blah, blah, blah. And people would take it as like, okay, he's not, he's not being better than us, not being dismissive of us. He's, he's just not going to do it. It was, you know. And it was always refreshing, too, that you weren't upset that people didn't like you. Yeah, yeah, which was nice. The graffiti yeah, that, on the bathroom wall, was... <laughs> it started to hurt. It started to get really personal. For a good time, <laughs> Especially don't because... call Jim Drobin. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was weird because the, the whole wall was really getting covered, and it was getting just increasingly violent. And it was weird because there was one executive bathroom that only Nick and I shared. And I thought, <laughs> right. you're the only other one with the key to this. Like, this is, it's clearly you. But Nick says it wasn't. So I don't know. Guys, the slashing of my tires. That was a good prank. I got to <laughs> say. a good one, I, guys. I, I it's like weird it. that Nick and I are working late, though. And <laughs> the death threats, the death threats are, are funny. <laughs> but cheeky. I think, I I think should, we should. But like, there, are, there are people the that I have hung out with, uh, you know, like higher end, you know, supervisor type people yeah. on shows. You know, uh, designers, directors, even uh, like stage managers and producers and people like that. And like my job doesn't have anything to do with their job. Right. So it doesn't matter. It's fun for us to hang out. Right. But if you say like, you know, you have a director, everybody knows what a director does. Sure. And uh, so you have a director. If the director and the sound guy are hanging out, we don't have work to talk about. Right. right. Like, all we have to talk about is, you know, whatever we're going to talk about. And we can sure. hang out and we can have a good time. Yeah. If, two different lanes. If, like, two performers come walking up, well, now the whole dynamic is different. Right. Yeah. Because that director has a direct impact on their lives. Sure. Yeah. yeah. No, I get it. I get it. And that totally makes sense in, in a lot of careers. I think that you could be yeah. in two different lanes and it doesn't even matter. Like, back in our day, running the rehab, you were the clinical director. We also had a medical director. 
right? And mm-hmm. you guys were in different lanes. <laughs> like mm-hmm. Your work did not touch, right. except that you were working with the same patients. He had his own command of authority, the nursing staff. You had all the therapists. Like, mm-hmm. it didn't matter. So, like, that was fine. It's it just not even on the same tier, you know, because mm-hmm. it just doesn't matter. So, But don't be offended, writer. Maybe uh, maybe that's actually a sign of respect. So flip yeah, it on I, its head. I, I go wouldn't look for sweat friends. it. No. Go look I, for friends. I wouldn't sweat it. Live you your life outside your, of your gig. Not in the workplace. We're going to take a quick break. And by the way, Jim's on a winning streak, all right? I'm coming up hot. Everything's coming up, Jim. Go to patreon.com slash therapy. You can hear Jacob just gushing over how right I am all the time. So it's very likely that I'm going to do very well. Oh, there's the mic. Ah, the mic's off. <laughs> ah, look at that. <laughs> all right. Warn you, Joven. We're, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to answer a question about favorite hobbies that now make us sick. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Today's episode is brought to you by Robert Brownie Jr. Mint, Kayla Lansbury, Crazy Manana Scoop, Malaya, and Cindy Ash. If you would like to sponsor the show, become a therapy producer at patreon.com slash therapy. And our trivia questions this week in honor of our therapy producers are about bizarre musical instruments. Oh, wow. Theremin. Final answer. What is that? Nailed it. That sounds like a chemical. Did no. I really? No, you didn't. No. That'd, be, that'd no. be really funny. No. But now you've eliminated I'll one of the I'll bet it's going to be that weird-ass ah. thing that... <laughs> you have eliminated one of the No, jeez. All right. So, uh, this instrument was invented around 1580 in Italy. It's a member of the lute family. Damn, I was just going to say it lute. Is, it is... <laughs> It is typically played with 14 strings, oh, God. 7 oh. fretted, 7 bass, but it can have up to 19. Whoa. The neck extends up to 6 feet in length. Whoa. Is it A, a sitar, Ooh. B, a schwamm, C, a, a thero, 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 theremin. Therobo, theremin, D, therobo? Oh, my God. Wow. And if you'd like to join the therapy producers and make the show possible, go to patreon.com slash therapy and sign up. Again, patreon.com slash therapy. I feel like sitar is an Indian instrument. Now, you said this was in the 1500s where? In Italy? Italy. See, I feel like that would be Indian. I think a sitar is Indian. What was that weird-ass instrument that Sting played that time? That was like at the Emmys or some crap. Guitar. Electric guitar. Ah, yeah. That one was cool. I liked all the noise it made. <laughs> all right. The only one I recognize out of those is sitar. And then Jacob said that one is a joke. So I'd assume you would have given it to him if it was right. A theremin. Yeah. So I'll execute that one out. I'll too. just tell you, I, I know exactly what a theremin is and it's not that. Okay. Yeah. Thank God. I'm going to rule out sitar. The thobo sounds make Therobo. that one. The robo. See, it almost sounds like an oboe, which is a wind instrument, which, but then again, maybe that has like a bass line to it. What was the second one? The orbo. Thor- I'm, I'm pronouncing that wrong. Hey, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm not holding you accountable. Uh, schwam. I'm going with schwam. That feels right. I feel it in my bones. It feels Italian. It's a schwam. How right? many strings did you say it has? A lot. It has 14. 14. It can have up to 19, but yeah. there's seven that are fretted, and then there's seven bass strings. Yeah. See, I know Schwamm that the sitar Latin. has a fuck ton of strings. It does. Yeah, that's that does sound. But th- it's Indian, man. You know it is. It doesn't feel right. Give me, give me the whole thing. Give me the first part of it again. I don't uh, need the whole thing. The, the instrument part. was invented around 1580 in Italy. Yeah, member Italy. of the lute family. Yeah. Typically w- played with 14 strings. But can have up to 19. The neck extends up to six feet in length. That ain't a sitar, man. Sitars are big. I'm going sitar. Whoa. Okay. Please don't be sitar. And you're going with schwam? Schwam. But I'm saying it with Italian accent. Oh. Schwam. <laughs> like that. Yeah, no, you're both wrong. Damn it. Was it the theremin? Uh, theorbo. No, it's never. Ah, I know it's, it's the not the theremin. Theorbo. What's a theremin? Theremin is a really cool theremin electronic is a neat thing. thing. It's electric uh, electromagnets. Yeah. Whoa. So you've got you, two you, hands. It's like an L shape. Oh. And you control pitch by moving one hand closer or further away from the rod. Think okay. of it as a three dimensional graph where you're moving between the X and Y axes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, like, and depending on where you are between. Like in, but in three dimensions between oh, yeah. those two axes what? depends on the tone that's being produced. Yeah, or, and then your other your other, other hand produced. is the volume. Yeah, so but you'll you're see not them. touching the strings. No, it's the electromagnetic. There's, there's, there's no strings at all. What? There's no strings at all. What? Theremin is it's, a neat thing. Look, oh, everybody, yeah. go do yourself a favor. Spell it. Google theremin. 
T H E R A M I N. Wow. Yeah, that's really cool. Dude, that is cool. The Theorbo is really cool, too. Well, it sounds pretty cool. I don't know the Theorbo. Sold me on this the Theorbo. So I actually got this from this uh, YouTube site. This guy, he's he does a whole bunch of really interesting instruments. He just okay. goes around and uh, plays whatever he can get I'm, his hands I'm gonna on. Have to, I'm going to have to look this up now because uh, I, we'll I need to give him credit. put it in the episode's description. Yeah. How about while you look that up, I read a letter. Okay, that, that sounds, sounds good. That sounds like a good sounds use of time. Good. Yeah. Favorite hobby now makes me sick. Hello, Dr. Tanzman. Rob Scallion. Rob Scallion. Okay. The creator of the Therabo. No, and the hobby he's is the YouTube channel. Oh. And the hobby is drinking Ipecac. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds right. All right. Hello, Dr. Tangeman and Mr. Jim Jones. <laughs> I'm not going to correct it. That's what it says. Thank you for creating your podcast. I am up to 115 episodes, and you are teaching me a lot of the strategies about mental health, like how to completely not trust myself. Who knew? Feelings are not facts. 10 for 10, we'll listen again. <laughs> it's been 10 years since I graduated college. I went to school for animation at an expensive for-profit school that cost me an insane amount of money, about $130,000. Leading up to graduation, between working full-time in my internship, I was doing 100 hours a week. After graduation, I had two internships and a full-time job. My first internship dumped me, and I bombed the second internship because I was so burnt out. I literally stopped functioning. Graduation ended, my internships ended, and my relationships ended in a scary and confusing way. My ex was drinking to self-medicate his schizophrenia. I didn't know that was going on until five years later. I just knew he was different, and I had to get away from my own safety. I have not dated anybody since. My entire life was leading up to graduation, and instead of exploding into a firework, it fell off a cliff, and I stayed at the bottom, broken and severely in debt. I was, in, uh, I was a great student, and I graduated with awards, but I effed up, and I was burned out. I couldn't handle obligations anymore. I was completely numb and didn't apply to a single job after college. I have been avoidant of my major and my favorite hobby ever since. I am gutted, crushed, traumatized. I can do artwork, but I haven't animated since graduation. The very word animation makes me uncomfortable and I'm sick to my stomach. I have nightmares all the time that I'm still in school, and I have one more semester even at my age. Even at my age, okay. I dream about, oh, even even though they've done it, I see. I, They're I, dreaming that they have one more semester. Yes, even at this okay. age that yeah. they're at right now. I dream about running into my old teacher, and I'm terrified to face her. I had a dream where they played some weird animated porn as my demo reel in front of all these industry people who flew in to see my demo. It was like it happened in real life. In this dream, uh, in this dream, my body released an arsenal of shame chemicals. I was so physically ill, I couldn't move for 30 minutes after the dream. In 2018, I had a very real anxiety attack when I finally got rid of my real demo reels, DVD, and other graduation material. Today, in my personal life, I am a high achiever with an okay job that takes a lot of pride in what I do. Logically, I understand everything. I understand most people don't work in the field they majored in, and I am not special. Many people have college stress and debt. I understand I can take small baby steps to back out of it. Obviously, my body is telling me something very different. I feel sick. I've decided I'm not as talented as I thought I was. I've given up dreams of working in the industry, but at least I want to animate again, just for my own personal enjoyment. It was my life. It didn't have to be good. I just loved doing it. I was so free. But now I can't think about animating without feeling an incredible weight that makes me scared. It hurts. It literally hurts. And I tear up thinking about it. I don't need this to be my job, but I need this to be my hobby again. The taste of failure and shame has absolutely paralyzed me. The most favorite thing in my life has become the most painful. I've not given up and I refuse to believe this is my fate. But is this even reversible? Thanks, guys. P.S., I have no idea what ice cream social is. You keep talking about it and making jokes, but frankly, I still don't know what the hell it is. I guess it's just a bunch of guys talking about everything. It's it's and not, nothing. It's not relevant. <laughs> P.S. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. <laughs> P.S.S. You guys need to grab Jacob and do a photo shoot together. Something that comes up on Google image search when you Google pod therapy. I'm thinking of a meme like three wolves moon t-shirt, except it's the three of you. It won't hurt your professional reputation too much, would it? 
Thanks, it, it would hurt Megan mine. Smith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, uh, with with the writer's permission, cut this one down. So hopefully, uh, writer, I did it justice. Yeah. Because uh, it was it was pretty good long, one. So yeah. Um, going to school, passionate about animation, but going through the debt and going through the collapse yeah. and going through hard times personally, out the other side, doing something professionally that looks nothing like what you went to school for. And wishing you could still enjoy your passion, your art, but now it makes you feel disgusted to do it. Man, that's a big burden. This is something that I honestly harp on. Oh, yeah? Anytime I do, um, I'm occasionally invited out to do talks, very occasionally invited out to do talks for high school students, and then uh, semi-regularity invited to go out and do talks for college students. Mm Mm-hmm. This is something that I absolutely harp on. Okay. As far as taking your art and trying to make it a profession. Oh, wow. This is not uncommon. Oh, really? Uh Yeah. Wow. It is hard to make your art into a profession in a way that you still find artistically gratifying. Wow. So this is a really common thing. Yes. Because especially in arts colleges and stuff, people are going to study it. Absolutely. But you study it ad nauseum? Do they just burn out? Do they get to a place where it's too much? You can burn out, but even like... If you do wonderfully in college, getting out into the world and just mm. trying to make money doing it, yeah. the ways that you try to make money with it, and, and you know, because you you have to get creative in a lot of cases, trying to make money yeah. doing your art, you know, be that uh, visual art or performance art or anything of that nature. Yeah, you know, like if you're a performance artist, especially, you're like you're going to end up. Uh, say you move to Los Angeles and mm. you're going to bec- you're going to become an actor in Los Angeles. You're going to end up wearing a bear suit at children's birthday parties right. yeah. five times a week. Yeah. And you say, like, well, this is performing? Right. But you're not doing it your way. Or say, you know, you, you, you're a visual artist. You might end up drawing caricatures. And now right. a lot of people love drawing. I, I know people personally yeah. in, in town here that absolutely love drawing caricatures. But if that's not something that your heart is in, yeah, and you're using this skill and this talent that you have to Just do it, to get paid. that could easily burn you out. Yeah. Or if you, you know, you might end up drawing, uh, you know, quote unquote, help hotel art. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, just just something to be produced and and just something to get that paycheck. Yeah. Like yeah. that is, it's hard, hard, hard. Yeah, especially when it's commercialized. Yeah. I imagine that takes a lot of the joy out of it. Absolutely. Because you're not doing it for what you want to do. You're not like, oh man, this would be a cool project. It's like. Nope, you're a hired gun. And by the way, you have 20 people who don't know fuck all about what you're doing telling, telling you their opinion on it. Yes. Yeah. Man. It's hard. So what is your advice to people? Don't like do it. That? You say, hey, be careful to silo your art away from your yeah. economy. Yeah. Wow. I, I Like, if you if you have another option, I, I just say don't do it. Yeah. But now then when you get into it, you you have to find outlets. Mm. You have to find outlets that that do fulfill you creatively. Yeah, yeah. So be, and, that, and that can be amateur. That can be you know for 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 performers. That can be you know a community theater. That can be you know anything. That that can be just uh, you know it can be a, a karaoke night. It can right. be you know you just go sing the songs that you like to sing and that you enjoy singing. You know it can it can be you know if you if you are an artist you know. The caricature thing. For, please forget I said the caricature thing because that sure. uh, there are a lot of fantastic artists out there who who do caricature work that really like it. Sure, and 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 it can be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so it, it you know it may be like I'm going to go work this party. I'm going to get paid a hundred bucks mm-hmm. over the course of four hours. Right, it's not great money, but I like it. But I'm going to go have a good time doing it. Right. I mean, I've heard a lot this with a lot of musicians too. Yeah, where they they get into this pattern where they're like, okay, I've written. You know, I've I've put out four albums mm-hmm. for money for the producers for the record company. Yeah. Right. I need to put one out for me. Right. right. And need to just kind of have that outlet. Palette cleanser. Now, a lot of the stuff that the writer's talking about really seems like I mean, she's talking about having nightmares yeah. about all this. And it's like very traumatic experience. Yeah. That's a lot. I want you to go deep. talk to somebody about that. Yeah, yeah. That's pretty deep. Because that almost seems like something specific that happened that yeah. That, and that's like that you need to process. Yeah, yeah. That that seems like you are taking it. Well, I, I don't know how else to say this. So rephrase this for me, guys. Yeah. Translate. It feels like you are taking this more personally than I want you to take it. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of shame. And it's hard to not take your art personally. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Yeah. But there seems to be a lot of shame, you know, and yes. the writer's dreams bear that out. 
the transformation of it into pornography in an embarrassing sense yeah. That, yeah. that shames you in front of those you desire to impress, you know, to, to look at this and be afraid of it. I like, mean, you, really you got, powerful. yeah. Cause you got into that field because you felt confident, you felt skilled, you still feel skilled in that area, but somehow that switched to massive insecurity yeah. about well, that, what you're doing. You just said it, the confident, you felt yeah. confident. Now that confidence is gone. Yeah. 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 And having that broken down, I mean, so a couple of things to this. I mean, I don't see a clear straight line between life event and this outcome. I see a broken and meandering set of dots of many, many difficulties, right? Trials and tribulation, breakdowns, and just getting to a place where this cost me a lot to do. Mm-hmm. I haven't had any home runs with it. It's been a while since I've, I've heard the crack of the bat against the ball and sent it over the, the, the wall here. So I get it. Like we get to this place where I'm ashamed of it, I'm embarrassed of it, or I just don't have that sense of power anymore. And I guess a good question here is how do you rekindle that spark? But I mean, if you're having that much trauma associated with it. Yeah. I mean, if it gets to the point where you feel like physically sick thinking about doing pretty it. Pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, I would want to analyze that. So, yeah. I mean, I think Jacob said it, but I'm going to reiterate it. Is this therapy worthy? Yeah. I yeah. think it really is. It is. Yeah. yeah. I would want to sit down and do probably the, the way we would probably approach this. So if you were visiting with a therapist, he told them everything he told us. I would suspect that their first hypothesis is this is an interesting psychosomatic trauma experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think that over time, they're going to want to do some CBT, unpacking the meaning underneath these, trying to get to those core fields. And then I think they're probably going to start nudging you toward an in vivo therapy. And in vivo is um, another way to, what do we used to call this with the spiders? We didn't call it in vivo. Call it something else. People are more familiar with another term. Well, there depends on how you're doing it. There's systematic desensitization. That there's flooding. It. There's yes, yeah. There's a lot. Of oh, it's like ways. if you're afraid of heights, go jump out of a plane. Yeah, yeah. you're afraid of spiders, so um, we put you in the presence of it. There's a yeah, more yeah. colloquial systematic way to call desensitization it. is exposing it to you. Exposure slowly. therapy. Exposure that was therapy. It. Yeah, yeah. Exposing so it to I you. I could see a therapist doing that. Slowly. I could see a therapist working up to. Hey, I'm giving you the small homework yeah. of, you know, let's animate something together. I want you to animate how you feel about animating or something like yeah. that or I, a passion I, project. I agree. I would have this directed by a therapist that you're working with. With the strength I wouldn't of the want feelings, to tell yeah. you. I wouldn't want to tell you just on this podcast. Just, you know, just go ahead and throw yourself no, into it. Because it, does, it doesn't feel reaction. like this is, like that's deep. a good idea. Yeah. Something's up. Yeah, yeah, something's up. So yeah, I yeah. want you to go through systematic desensitization trauma therapy with a therapist. And then I would want you to start animating things for pod therapy, which I think Actually, everybody knew I was going to go for. You know, I'm, right. I'm going to go for the ask. You know? I mean, <laughs> here, here's what I would honestly tell someone. If, 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 if we were friends sitting in a bar yep. and you were telling me this, the first thing I would say is, why don't you just go find a project out there that you feel excited about? Yeah, you feel good about. And just go do it. Who, yeah. It doesn't matter you know, if it pays, it doesn't pay. Just for you. Yo, go and even if it's just like, go start an Etsy shop. Sure, where yeah. you're just creating stuff, and people may or may not buy it. Yeah, and and don't go into it with the with the expectation that anybody is ever going to buy any of it. Yeah, but just go, you know, go create some stuff and try to find that place that you used to live in. Yes, where you really took pride and pleasure in creating this stuff. Yeah. That being said, I don't want to say that I right. would recommend any of this. Instead of going and talking to someone, because yeah. I really think you should big, go talk to somebody. There's yeah. a hang up, and and you know what's interesting? Now that I think about it, I, I had a case similar to this, where the person was a fabric artist, so they uh, created professional costumes. Okay, and so they're very very talented, and um, they burned out on it. They had a really big list of negative experiences in their industry. Um, where things got really yucky and really abusive, and they started having really bad anxiety attached to any kind of this work. Yeah. So they did not want to create anymore. They were terrified of criticism. It had become such a toxic culture surrounding it and cosplay and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they used to make good money at it. They used to be well-known, and they just disappeared off the Internet. They got away from social media because they were so terrified. Charlie Chaplin. Charlie Chaplin. (laughs) And so Charlie and I came up with a strategy... That we actually decided over the course of work together, and again, writer, this is an individual story that maybe you relate to. It's not the advice I'm giving you. But together, as their therapist, we had decided 
this is not something that we're going to go back to. This is something we're going to let go because we had tried to kind of dabble in it. And, don't and we had a- discovered it was just unhealthy for that person. Do not be afraid yeah. to step back from this and say, this might be a nice hobby to go back to later. Maybe later. Yeah, yeah. Maybe later. But I do yep. strongly encourage you to get with a therapist about this. I did good work with a person yeah. that dealt with a very similar situation, physically ill about doing it. Yep. And, you know, we got to a place where they were able to do it privately for themselves mm-hmm. in very limited quantities. I know a ton of different different manner of artists mm-hmm. that are hobbyists. Yeah. Nothing they they wrong become with that. hobbyists and it is wonderful for them and their friends are you know it's one of those things that they can pull out and say like I can do this. Yeah. And they and they do something. They and their friends are their friends. and their friends are blown away. That, right. Oh, you have this talent. Right. This is amazing. It's it's so wonderful that you that you have this. Yeah. But then there's no reason to take it on the road. Yeah. That's you know, not for them. Yeah. So I mean, hey, that would be where I'd start it. And like mm-hmm. I said, once your therapist cures you, come on back. Do a bunch of mental health animations for pod therapy. Obviously. Obviously. Well, I mean, if you want to do artwork that donate you, don't to care, us. you don't care whether or not yeah. it sells. We've been grifting Our off Kate for a long best. time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean. Kate was like, I, I mean, can draw. We were like, really? Draw us I, everything. <laughs> I learned how to use, <laughs> use uh, what, the Adobe yeah, f- animation. Yeah, anim- yeah. Used Illustrator. To, yeah. And, and like, I've put a bunch of stuff up there, and I haven't sold jack shit. Yep. So, like, also, <laughs> we should pitch the store right about now. Yeah. Podtherapybaitshop.com. Yeah. It still exists. <laughs> we should, uh, we'll also answer the other question. So, Ice Cream Social is oh, yeah. another is podcast, actually, that, yeah. that, uh, Jacob is a part of. There. Yes. What now? They've, uh, <laughs> They've if you want to find Jacob, you shouldn't Google pod therapy. You should they, Google uh, ice cream social. <laughs> <laughs> They've been around a lot longer. Uh, they were much more established. And so when we yes. got into the field, um, they, adopted we, uh, us. they kind of adopted us, took us uh, took pity under their us. wing. They've provided the studio. They've given us a lot of great advice, and they have regretted it ever since. Yep. True. Matt so. and Matt and Lee's Ice Cream Social. If you look yes. up Ice Cream Social on any of your pod, uh, any of your uh uh, podcast podcast that's what, that's what I'm trying to or find or go to heyscoops.com that's true or you, you find can us. find their best shirts at podtherapybaitshop.com that's just true <laughs> go we also have a shop shirt. that you can design a merchandise for us as well damn it oh, <laughs> come on over <laughs> do both animator I'm they're saying gonna, do both you're gonna give us sweet stuff for yeah, our it's gonna be Instagram great. if we'll you wanna know it. what Jacob looks like uh, just imagine uh, Jesus in a saint's hat that's it yeah, give that's, or take. It's not far off. That's not that's no, not very that's pretty far close. Off. American yeah. Jesus. White guy Jesus. Cajun yeah, white Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, I think yeah. Cajun Jesus. But you don't have abs like Jesus. No, Jesus True. is shredded. Hey, I'm Jesus not, is shredded. I'm not <laughs> CrossFit. That'll do it. It's not CrossFit. Oh, that's Jesus CrossFit has a swimmer's body. body. He does. Yeah. Swimmer's yeah. Oh, jeez. All right, we're going to turn page real quick. <laughs> <laughs> this is going I in a bad direction. direction. Somebody, and I forget who. I think it's Rick and Morty. We're going to take Somebody remind me who said Jesus has a swimmer's body. We're going to take a quick break. Tag pod therapy. Yeah, it's Sin City Street. <laughs> Let's bail out before I go to hell for this. Body. I'll save you, Jesus. We're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about dating a functional alcoholic. You're listening to Pod Therapy. Today's episode is brought to you by Robert Brownie, Junior Mint, Kayla Lansbury, Crazy Mana Scoop, Malaya, and Cindy Ash. If you'd like to become a therapy producer, you can do so at patreon.com slash therapy. The next question about bizarre musical instruments is... There's literally a candle where... Jacob is Jesus. It's right there. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Somebody photoshopped him onto Jesus' body. That put him accurate. on one of those Walmart right, that's gonna be a uh, That's going to be a uh, scoop fest. That's great. Giveaway. All right. This is a pitched percussion instrument that is played with a keyboard and consists of at least 23 cast bronze bells fixed sus- in fixed suspension and tuned in chromatic order. Chromatic order. So that they can be sounded harmoniously together. Invented by Benjamin Franklin? No. Housed in bell towers, they are usually owned by churches, universities, or municipalities. I know I've seen it. I just, what are we going to call it? Bells? Hell's Bells, final answer. Carillon. (laughs) B. Cymbalon. Wait, what was the first one? Carillon? Carillon. Carillon. Cymbalon. Cymbalon. Glockenspiel. That's right. Or Hurdy Gurdy. Oh, I dibs on Hurdy Gurdy. <laughs> if you'd like to join the Therapy Producers <laughs> Mix Show Possible, go to patreon.com slash therapy. Yeah, I just want it to be Hurdy Gurdy. I'm just going all in on this one. It's fine. I'm, 
I'm almost positive the last two are musical instruments. Glockenspiel's definitely they are they are okay all of them, are. but it's not a Glockenspiel. That, yeah, I don't think it's a Glockenspiel. Somewhere my elementary school memories are telling me I know what that is, and it, it was not a huge ass wall of bells. The first one was Carillon, and then the second one Cymbalon. Cymbalon. I'm going with that one. Cymbalon. B. Yeah. I'll bet okay. you you're right, but I'm going all in on Hurdy Gurdy. Go for it. Take I it. want it to be Hurdy Gurdy. I don't think it's Hurdy Gurdy. Okay. Both of you are 0 and 2. Damn okay. it. Was is it, it a? Glockenspiel? It's a. It ah, is A. That was my second Carillon. guess. It wasn't yes. a Glockenspiel. It was a Carillon. What's a Hurdy Gurdy? Hurdy Gurdy is like, uh, I can't even describe it's when it. when you go you'll, you'll Hurdy Gurdy on him. You'll have to Google it. I it's, don't uh, want to Google it. I'm it's... terrified of what will come up. Who knows what's inside the depths of the Hurdy Gurdy? Search engine. I shall pass. So the correct answer was the Cymbalon? Uh, no, it's the Carillon. 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 Wow. And it's like a wall of bells? It's not a wall of bells. It's like a bell tower. Oh. Right? So, like, universities have them. My university had one. Oh, I'm thinking of... The one I was thinking of is the spin... The, the Ben Franklin invented, I'm pretty sure, is, like, Little spinning crystal glasses. Oh. But oh. they're all stacked inside of one another. And so you can kind of play it similarly to how you would play a piano. Oh. Okay. But they are spinning autonomously. Huh. And so you're just putting a finger on it, and it's creating the tone that you would get. Franklin oh, like Crystal Spinner. Oh, what is that called? Heard of that. That's, no, but that's, that's a weird probably a hurdy yeah. I've so met one is, person in my life who knew how to play it. This is, it's There's really cool to see somebody play this, but it's basically like, it's laid out like a huge piano. Okay. And each key, you know, is like a long rod. Okay. And you have to play it like you that. Slam you slam the rods. Really, oh, you really, wow. all of them. And it's Jeez. really cool to, to watch it. That is cool. Yeah. Glass Armonica is oh, what I'm thinking of. Oh, that'd be okay. a great name for a band. Yeah. Oh, I like it. One of the most celebrated instruments of the 18th century. Hurdy huh. gurdy. Erdy gurdy gurdy. That's what I was thinking. It's the Swedish <laughs> chef there you go. from the Muppets. Ah, damn it. Erdy gurdy gurdy gurdy. So you're even more wrong than you thought you were. I don't know. I think I'm getting closer. <laughs> now I'm just really mad that one of your like obscure musical instruments was not the glass harmonica. Yeah. Should have made the list. I didn't even know that existed. I would have gotten that one. Yeah. You probably would have. Super <laughs> popular in the 18th fucking century. Man knows his 18th century glass <laughs> instruments. No, I did a show like... Eight or nine years ago, and they hired a guy that played the glass harmonica. That probably was That's super crazy. cool. It yeah. was crazy cool. That is cool. He also did an act where he would just play the uh, the crystal glasses as well. Oh yeah, just yeah. To, like you know, he had it's twenty hard. some odd crystal glasses with different amounts of water in them. Oh, yeah. and That's he could cool. and he could do that. But That's yeah, the glass awesome. harmonica was just it, it. It's so cool because it's it's all of these kind of you know glasses within glasses. Yeah, and so it, it's Glassception. just deception. And uh, they rotate on a motor. Uh, but the uh, the bottom of the instrument is just a a little tray of water, oh. so they are constantly going through that tray of water and relubricating themselves. Oh, oh. What? Yeah, I gotta watch a video on this. Yeah, yeah. Glass harmonica is a good. We've if learned you, a lot. I, I bet if you <laughs> let's, let's see. I bet if I just Google it and Google a video, I bet the guy that I know will just come up. And I'm gonna read the letter again while these guys are on YouTube. Yep, there he is. <laughs> Dating a functional alcoholic. Hey guys, I'm in a relationship. Oh, hey, Laura. Ooh, <laughs> oh, hey. nice. <laughs> hey guys, I'm in a relationship with a really, really amazing man, but he struggles with alcoholism. I would say that he's a functioning alcoholic if such a thing exists. He was very open with me from our very first date about his addiction, and I think I was very naive about it. It wasn't that he lied about any of it, but I think I saw it as not as bad as it was. It wasn't until we were already in a relationship and I was very much in love with him and he relapsed after a few months sober and I ended up meeting up with his wife, not yet divorced but separated from, that I truly understood the extent of his alcoholism. I knew their marriage ended because of it, but I also learned about the times he'd put his child in danger due to his drinking. His little boy was fine, but easily could not have been. And all of the lying and secret drinking he'd done during their marriage. I decided to stay with him. Maybe that's stupid. I know I have friends and loved ones who think that's the case, but I really want to give him a chance. A chance to get better and to be the amazing man I know he is capable of being and who is already who he is already when he's sober. I find, due to my own anxiety and OCD issues, that trust in this relationship is difficult for me. His wife has actually been really lovely and supportive of me, and we spoke a lot about signs to look out for with his drinking, etc., etc., 
From what I know so far, he has told me all of the times that he'd had a drink and has been honest. However, my own obsessive thinking and anxiety means I worry constantly. I found myself the other day checking the dregs of his soft drink and comparing how it smelt and looked compared to unopened ones in case he put alcohol in there and similar things like that. Checking when he's been to the shop that he's not come back smelling of alcohol or acting differently. We talk about it a lot, my concerns, my anxiety, his drinking, and that helps being able to lay them out and have them taken seriously. And I am in therapy myself and have been for a long time, so that helps too. Anyway, to my actual question, I sort of have two. What support is out there for partners of alcoholics? Books, reading, or video materials, support groups, things like that. Secondly, any advice for being in a relationship with someone struggling with addiction? I've done lots of reading up on it to try and understand more over the past few months, but I'm interested in your thoughts. Thanks, guys. Anonymous. Mm. They Big one there. They said the person... Is or is not currently drinking? I guess, like, I guess they are because they're because they're calling them functioning. Yeah, yeah, bouts of it. It sounds like yeah, it's still able to to live, but definitely doing it. But the the writer seems to say, sp- uh, boyfriend. It sounds like as it isn't spouse is uh, is honest about it. Is not apparently lying, but then uh, writer is terrified and is anxious all the time. So talking about what is alcoholism is oh, probably man. important here, and then talking about resources. So, Nick, what do you think on this one? So, I guess one of the first thing that sticks out to me is the part where you're talking about, uh, you know, you're you're checking the drinks that he has, you're following up on all these different things that he's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I'd really want you to take a look at that because that says a lot right there. Mm-hmm. Is that the type of relationship that you imagined that you would have that you're going to be following up? And you're going to be doing all of these things constantly. Mm. I mean, part of it probably has to do with some of your anxiety, as you had identified. Um, But that just does not seem like a very fulfilling relationship. So I think you're going to have to, at some point, draw some sort of boundary here as far as what you want out of this relationship and what he's going to need to do in order for you to have the type of relationship that you want. Mm. You can be supportive. But you don't want to become somebody's babysitter. You don't want to be constantly checking up on them like they're, uh, like like it's they're not, a child. Not your responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as far as resources available, the first thing I'm going to point you to is Al-Anon. Yeah, I think Al-Anon is going to be hugely beneficial to you. Yes. So Al-Anon, if you think of like AA, AA is a 12-step program for alcoholics. Um, then there's NA. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different offshoots of different uh, 12-step based programs. Al-Anon is meant for family members yes. of alcoholics. And I think that's probably going to be the best source of support for you. You're going to meet a whole bunch of people there. They're going to be very friendly. They will welcome you. And you get to learn from what other people have done. Um, similar to kind of the relationship that you've had now with his uh, his ex, you know, where she's kind of supportive and she can tell you specifically about him, but you yeah. can go to these Al-Anon meetings and you can learn a lot of techniques that people have uh, used before. You get a lot of like things to look out for. They'll talk to you a lot about how is the best or what's the best way to, for you to take care of yourself, how to set and enforce these boundaries. Uh, I, I just, I think that's going to be the best thing yeah. for you. Yeah. You, I, I would bet that you will be shocked by because you you've talked to the to the ex wife you've talked to the ex spouse mm-hmm. yeah and and they know their ex husband yeah I would be I I would bet money that you would be shocked if you go into Al Anon and speak with some people that have been around some of the group leaders and whatnot that have been around and they will tell you things about your boyfriend that, and about his behavior that you yeah. will be amazed that they know yeah yep. and they and obviously they don't know him. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But they know that that experience and, and what you're going through, too. So I, I love that advice off the bat. And, you know, just to just to normalize it a little bit, writer. So I don't talk about it much on the show. I don't even know that I've ever mentioned it on the show. I'm a card carrying member of Al-Anon, um, and it has been one of the most important communities that I have ever been a part of. It has given me so much. 
And even as a therapist, you'd think, you know, you read all these damn books on the subjects, you, you go get licensed in addictions, you know how to help, um, but you still are a human. And, and whenever you have a loved one in your life who struggles with a pattern of self-destruction and, and alcoholism, you realize very quickly that you get sucked into trying to save them and trying to help them and trying to rescue them and, and you want to fix it for them or you want to protect them or you want to snoop like you're doing and, and hold them accountable and discover the truth and, and try to help them. And, and it all comes from a place of love, but we become very controlling and we become ultimately codependent. And, and so there's a, a saying that we, we say to each other in Al-Anon. We, we tell each other there's the three C's, which I know I've said on the show before. Um, but it's, it's been very important to me in my life. And, and the thing that we try to tell each other is, you didn't cause this. That's the first C. You can't control this. And you can't cure this. And, and we say that to each other to remind one another that the responsibility for getting better does not fall upon us. And we are collateral damage to our loved one's behaviors. And there, there can be a lot of things that come out of that. There can be sadness. There can be pain. There can be resentment. Uh, there can be worry and fear and anxiousness and a desire to help them. And, and all that's very sincere. But you need that support. And, and that's why I would want you to go to Al-Anon. You know, you heard Nick explain the difference between AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and Al-Anon. I know those names can be very fuzzy. Uh, but if you just type in AL-Anon, A-N-O-N, You'll find tons of resources in your area. There's always a group in your area, or you can get onto the Zoom groups. There's, there's many I was going to say, books. they've got to have online stuff. Tons. Point, right? mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah, tons. And it's very, very helpful. And uh, even in COVID times, I've been able to go to meetings uh, completely online. It's very helpful. And of all the books that I've picked up through Al-Anon, they, they have a library on their website. If you go to the meetings, they'll usually have the books on a table, and they'll sell them to you at cost. They just want to get them into your hands. Lots of pamphlets, lots of resources. But the book that I've gotten from Al-Anon that has been hands down the most important for my journey uh, was a book called Paths to Recovery, Al-Anon's Steps, Traditions, and Concepts. Now, there's also an Al-Anon big book that, that tells stories that you might relate to, but that one I just quoted was very helpful for me because it gave me structure to kind of work my own program of personal recovery That had to do with me recognizing my codependent behaviors, the ways that I get entangled and enmeshed, and and the ways that I have to to pull back for for not just myself, but for the person I love, so that they can find their own recovery. And that's going to be a big part of this too, writer. And there's another book I want you to take a look at called Codependent No More. Um, It's a book about somebody surviving um, with an alcoholic spouse and, and how they came through that. And so it's very powerful stuff, and, and I think they write a lot in there about codependency. So that would definitely be uh, some resources for you. But, Nick, I, I definitely don't want to leave this topic without addressing a question that the writer implies in their, their letter, which is, I'm not sure if, if my, my boyfriend or fiancé in this case is an alcoholic. And I think a lot of listeners wonder, you know, what is the threshold for, for this line and so back of the envelope, you know, as an addictions expert, what would you teach the writer about, here's kind of a short way to think about addiction, alcoholism. There's a, there's a way to kind of ballpark this without calling it this, without diagnosing it. But there's a way to sort of notice, hey, if you notice these patterns, uh, they might be an alcoholic. Yeah, I mean, this is where it always gets kind of weird because there's technically no definition of alcoholic per Correct. se because when we're diagnosing it we're diagnosing a substance it's not use a disorder. clinical term yeah not a clinical yeah term. so it'd be an alcohol use disorder sure um in which case there's a lot of criteria with that there's 11 criteria but really what we're kind of talking about would be like the four c's exactly. of addiction mm-hmm. right so uh if they're experiencing cravings that's one um which can be physical cravings where they actually feel like they need to have a drink um, and it could also be emotional cravings, where it's like, man, I'm not steady, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I need to get a drink in me in order to feel better. Yeah, so cravings is one. Oh, my God, I'm blanking on the four seats of it. Um, There's the Nina, the Pinta, keep the going. Santa yeah. Maria. Okay, got to get them all. There's yeah. there's uh, Larry, Curly, and Moe. There's uh, that sounds Grumpy, right. Doc, Happy. Sleepy, bashful. Oh my god, I got five of them. Uh, I got them here. You want them? I got, I got them. Okay. Compulsion. I can That's do one. it. I just yes. don't want to one up them. I'm trying to give them a chance to no, look it not. up. 
Do you want me to do it? I'll just do it, Tangerman. I'll leave you in the dirt. craving, consequences, and control. Very good. So uh, the compulsion is kind of that behavior, that compulsive behavior where it's it uh, they they just they need that they just have to continue to to behave in that way they have to continue to drink continue to use the substance, the cravings we already mentioned then you got the consequences so continued use despite consequences yes so that's one of the big uh, telltale signs that there's a problem is when you continue to experience problems as a result of it, but you continue the behavior right. regardless. Getting a DUI, yeah. getting you know called out at work, uh, your kids being in danger, even if nothing bad happened, the fact that something could have, and you were horrified by that, but then you keep drinking anyway. Yeah, and then you've got the uh, lack of control, yeah. which ultimately would be uh, like somebody who sets limits on it but isn't able to stick to it, yeah. or has tried quitting but... Relapsed. ultimately continues to go back to it. Yep. Um, so a lot of these actually, they kind of overlap with the substance use disorder diagnostic criteria. Um, but then the diagnostic criteria goes a little bit further. It talks about increased tolerance, uh, withdrawal symptoms, you know, when they quit, uh, preoccupation, which yes. uh, e- essentially is like uh, their their time just revolves around it so if they're right. not if they're not drinking they're getting ready to drink yeah they're recovering from the effects of drinking right. or they're thinking about drinking yep. they're planning their life so that they can budget time and resources to make sure they right. get some drinks use in hazardous situations so while driving while operating a forklift while at watching work. your kids you yeah. know you're yeah. on daddy duty you're yeah. you know you're split from your wife and you're on daddy duty it's your weekend and you have to drink anyway even though you're swimming with the kids or whatever i think the thing that we need to talk about is the functional part yeah which is really you know because i people that have asked word me this. always scares the shit out of me <laughs> yeah <laughs> well because it's meaningless yeah. like it doesn't that's like, that's why though yeah exactly because, because it's, it's a conditioning word that people throw on it to yeah. to make it more palatable yeah right. i mean so but he still goes to work s- right yeah, so somebody will bills. say is it possible to be a functioning alcoholic? Well, what's your definition of functioning? Right. Like, not dead. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. and it's I always mean, temporary. You know, one yeah. of the things that the AA crowd will say is that this disease always leads to what is it? It's like prisons, hospitals, Jails, and institutions, and death. Right. That's it. And so, yeah. like, yeah, you're functional for now. And right. That's, that's yeah. what I was about There's functional to say. cancer, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Every, yeah. Everything is functional until yeah. it's not. Until it's yeah. not. But we consider alcoholism and all addictions to be essentially a terminal illness. We consider it progressive, chronic, and terminal. So, again, that's not to to scare you, writer, but I think that we want to come alongside you and say, we want you taking this the right amount of serious. Don't poo-poo it. Don't minimize it. That's one of the tricks alcoholism and, and all addiction tries to do is it says, but I'm not like Larry. Larry, that guy I used to work with, man, that's a real alcoholic. And I'm not like Grandpappy. Grandpappy, man, he was ridiculous. All There's the always time. somebody who's worse. Always somebody who's worse. Or you know what? You know, it, it, That's the thing. When well, you go yeah. to the rooms, you go to AA, first thing they'll tell you is, listen, man, you might have a higher bottom than somebody else. But that don't excuse you from having the same problem. Right. Well, and, and bottom too. I always have an issue with like people saying hitting rock bottom. It's sure. like, well, all rock bottom is just is the worst day you've had so, so far. So far, exactly. yeah. yeah, yeah. I it's mean, like that meme when Homer Simpson corrects Bart. Yeah. Bart's like, "This is the worst day of my life," and Homer's like, "It's the so worst day far. of your life so far." Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's yeah. where it could go. So take it yeah. seriously, writer. But you've got to get help for the, yourself. I mean, the other thing, too, that I like to explain to people is that we're dealing with a chronically relapsing condition. Right. <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that somebody can't achieve long-term recovery. Right. You know, people do that. I know people who've been clean for or, or we, we're, we're kind of getting away from clean as the, yeah, the word now, sober. but, but been, been in recovery yeah. for 40 years, you know, right. and it's, but the thing that people don't understand is that when we talk about relapse, as far as a relapse cycle, I always like to look at relapse as a scale from zero to 10, where 10 is actually using the substance again. Right. People who have been free from this use for 15, 20 years it's not that they've spent 15 or 20 years at zero. Yeah. Right. They're constantly on the scale. Yeah. The difference is, is that the people who have long-term recovery recognize where they're out on the scale yeah. and they're able to get yes. back to zero. Right. I was so, just having a conversation with a, with a friend of mine last week. He's 23 years sober. Oh, yeah. Wow. And wow. that's exactly and, and what he was talking about. He was like, you know, I'm 23 years sober. It's great. It feels good. And it's something I have to work on every single day. Right. Yeah. 
Exactly. Right. It's it's not auto. It, it in twenty three years, it's, it's still not autopilot. No. Yep. Still cognizant. Yep. Well, and even you know, writer, go back in our archives, find the episode titled "John, the Man Inside the Magic Dragon." Really interesting oh, yeah. guest it's good shared one. his personal story of overcoming alcoholism. And one of the things that will stay with me forever is when he said, man, I have never been happier than giving this up. Like every day I'm like, oh, that was a great decision. Like I never yeah. miss it. I'm good. But I still have to work on it, yeah. yep. even though I don't want it, even though I hate it. And like I'm so happy I don't have this in my life. And I still have to be intentional, mm-hmm. you know, and, and make sure that I'm doing good self-care. It doesn't happen by accident. You know, we're always yeah. able to go back. One well, question I always like to ask, and this is, this is a meaningless question. So I want to preface this with it. It is a meaningless question. This is the show for that. <laughs> <laughs> meaningless answer. If your, therapy, <laughs> that's what we do. If your boyfriend, fiance, goes to the doctor and the doctor says, I, I've got the results of your blood test back. Your liver is looking a little iffy. Yeah. I'd like you to stop drinking. Right. What is their response? It's interesting, right? And, 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 you know, it's hypothetical. You don't know, you don't know for sure until it yep. happens. Yep. But it's looking a little spotty. Right. It's looking yep. a little shitty. Cirrhosis. I'd like it, it's not cirrhosis. It's not it's not to cirrhosis point. It's not it's yeah, it's just like bad enzymes. Your liver is looking a little fatty. Yeah. I'd like you to stop drinking. Sure. What do you do? Right. Well, and really what you're getting at there is you're getting at motivation to change. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there's the stages of change uh, and we're all in these stages of change for anything. So there's pre-contemplation, which means you're not even considering it. You don't even realize that there's a need for it. Mm -hmm. There's contemplation, which means that you're starting to become aware. The ambivalence is lifting. Mm -hmm. So you're like, okay, maybe I do need to change something at some point. I'm not going to do it right now. Right. But maybe something needs to change. Maybe there's a problem. Then there's uh, Preparation. preparation, which is, okay, I need to make a change. I should probably get ready for that to happen at some right. point. Not doing yeah. anything yet. Then you've got action and maintenance. Yep. So action is you are implementing that change, and then maintenance is you've made it, and you've, you're now maintaining it. And people are going through this, these stages of changes, stages of change constantly. Yeah, oh, they're nice. nonlinear. You yeah. hop around. I mean, the this other could, thing this could be going to the gym. I mean, this, yeah. is, this is a lot of things. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, it's, exactly. It's a model it's for like, human I'm, behavior. I'm gaining a little more weight than I want to gain. <laughs> the yeah. other thing that's really interesting, too, is that everybody is in the action stage of change or preparation stage of change for something. Sure. Mm-hmm. So he may be in the pre-contemplation stage of change for quitting alcohol, but the preparation stage of change for getting you off his back. Sure. Right. 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 So, yeah. That motivates so that, him. Yeah. And and that that's a starting point, you know. Yeah. And then that's where a, a an addictions counselor will will work and and kind of build off of that point. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess the big thing is just to understand that you know if this is the relationship that you want to stay in. This is you're in it for the long haul and yeah. it's going to be work and it's it, yeah. it's work that you are going to have to do for yourself primarily that you work on yourself first and then he has to come to you. Yes. You don't go to him. Absolutely. Um, and what I mean by that is when you have set yourself up at a standard and you're doing well, you're going to your meetings, you're mm-hmm. doing the things that you need to do. You don't lower the bar. To meet him where he's at. Exactly. Yeah. He has to, he's got to work his program and yes. he's got to be at that level to maintain yep. it. And that's really tough for family members because family members, they, it's uh, very hard. they love them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, okay, well I can sacrifice a little bit and I can, you know, I can back off a little bit. I can, I can do this. I can kind of, right. I need, I need to support him, but you can't because if, uh, you have to take care thing. of yourself first. Well, and that's the hardest thing of all. Like, and that's the thing whenever you're the, the family member of, of, you know, in this case, we're calling this an alcoholic. You, the hardest thing you can ask this person to do, the hardest thing you can ask the writer to do is nothing. That's, that's not how we're wired. We want to be helpers. We want to be rescuers. We want to get in there and fix it, handle it for them, solve it, figure out what the underlying issue is, see their potential. And that's the thing, too. You look at them and go, man, their potential is amazing. What a wonderful human being. If only they could be this person that I know that they are, everything will be great. And so you hang in there, and, and like you, you got to do your own program first. And, mm-hmm. and that's the thing. So go to Al-Anon. If you're a person of mm-hmm. uh, faith, Look up Celebrate Recovery. See if there's any programs in your state that, that offer that. That's a church-based version of it. Um, you know, any church you go to will probably have it. There's online ones. Uh, Codependent No More is a great book, and that other book that I referenced, The 12 Steps. 
Um, definitely grab those writer, but it starts with you. It, you did not cause this. You cannot cure this. You cannot control this. You have to accept that. And so you have to take care of yourself first, and then the rest will work itself out or it won't. Anytime I hear this, it terrifies me. Yeah. It really does. Yeah. I, mean, I've, I've, I have a, a dear friend who last month left her fiancé, mm. that they and they have a, uh, a four-month-old baby together. Mm. And, you know, he's an alcoholic. Yeah. He started to relapse. He, he relapsed a few times during the pregnancy, and after the baby was born, went hard. Yeah, mm. and she said, "I can't. I can't have you around the baby. Yeah, yeah. I can't. Yeah. You know, for the you know, I, I have to look out for the baby. I have to look out for the safety of the baby. And uh, and he, I don't know if he still is, but he he was in AA. Good. She was in Al Anon. Good. I believe. I, I I think she's still going to meetings, even though the relationship is off now. But I, I think she's still going to occasional meetings. You need uh, to juggling that around uh, now being a single mother with a with a four month old. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, you know she is she's doing that work and and holy shit! Every time I hear someone say my significant other has an addiction issue, what do I do? It mm. just scares the shit out of me. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, it's real life. Yeah, it's real life, and I think it's too and it easy. Has, and it has severe consequences. Very. Yeah. And you know, it's too easy in popular culture. People just go, "Oh, you just need to leave them." Blah blah blah. It's so easy. It's never you that have easy. No it's never idea easy. how it's hard. It's never easy when you love somebody. I remember one time I was I was talking to this man, and he was Armenian, and um, his son, who was a, a grown man, was you know in the program, and we were telling this this elder man that he needs to stop. He needs to not support him anymore. Mm-hmm. And he held up his hand. He said, which finger should I cut off? Because that's what you're asking me to do. No. Like, and Jim pointed her finger and said this I, one. I flipped him off, and I mm-hmm. said, this one. So it, it's a real thing. You know, it's a real thing. And so go get help for yourself. Yeah. That's where it has to start. And you know what? That's where you're going to figure out what to do next. Uh, but it starts with self-care. It's got to. And my, it's not selfish. And yep. get a sponsor. My advice for this is always, 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 Start with you. you're number one. Yep. Mm-hmm. Gotta you, be. you have to look out for yourself first. And it's not even selfish, right? You, no. You honestly, you're you no damn you good them. to the other yes. person. That's the thing. Yeah. Like, well, you'll think that you, you can save them. Shape. You can't do it. The, uh, you, you have to be in good shape first. That's right. The rooms are notorious for their sayings. Yes. And one of their sayings that I absolutely love is just like what the uh, what the flight attendant tells you. You have to secure your mask first before you help anybody else. That's mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and it's not a question of how much you love people or whether or not. No, no, no. no. There's no martyrdom here. It's you literally cannot yeah, do, it. do it. Yeah, you are incapable of solving. You don't have oxygen coming into your brain. Yeah. You're going to pass out before you can get the oxygen mask on your kid's brain. That's yep. right. It doesn't matter who you are, what you know, what books you've read. You do not have the ability to help somebody in your own family. You have to go get help for yourself. That's where it starts. And then, you know what? You figure out what happens there. But, you know, more will come. More will be revealed. Take mm-hmm. care of yourself. Yeah. Okay? al go check it out. So we are at the end of the show. And we've got some new patrons to thank. <laughs> no, we got, uh, we got a lot of stuff first. <laughs> oh, Lord Almighty. All right. So we do have... Oh, we've got to draw for this quarter's merchandise winner. Oh, yes, I wonder what these papers that Nick has been fiddling with yeah. are. Yeah. All right. So every quarter... Everybody at which level? Which level and up? This is the Theradactyl and Theraproducers. So, so if you join levels. as a Theradactyl and you stick with us for a quarter, Theradactyl or higher, you're automatically entered into a drawing. We do it at the end of every quarter. If you've stuck with us for a whole quarter, you get drawn. Jacob is pulling from the hat blindly. Who is our winner of free merch, Jacob? Lord Colin Stewart. Oh, shit. Really? Lord Colin Stewart, man. He inched his way into this. Yeah. yeah Good like, job. Yeah. Lord Colin Stewart even has Lord printed on his his uh, paper here. Yeah, nice. I, I, I know how to do it. We could hook it up. Very yeah. well done. So congratulations, so, Lord uh, Colin Stewart. We, What's Lord Stewart getting? Uh, he gets the blanket. Ooh. Ooh. The, uh, it's getting chilly. The, the, uh, the slightly blanky. used blanket that's yes. been in Nick's apartment <laughs> for the last The one that your dogs quarter. sleep on every yeah. night? Yeah. yeah, yeah. My, my dog blanket. Yeah, yeah. That's what we get. <laughs> that's good that he gets that pod therapy blanket. Oh, it's, a, uh, it's a beautiful pod therapy blanket. It's a hooded blanket. Ooh, call it a vintage oh, one, too. It's a, make it it's, a, cool. it's a blanket with a hood. Vintage. Yeah. Vintage yeah, blanket so. with a hood. I love it. I think there's a name for that, but I don't think we're allowed to say it for copyright infringement. Poncho. Yeah, let's go with that. Let's go with poncho. <laughs> also rain resistant. Yeah, it's also rain resistant. <laughs> so it's just a piece of plastic I think, we got at the store. I think. Yeah, it's Walmart but bags. I mean, We've every them every piece of cloth is rain resistant yeah. to a point. To a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Not per, not it might be, the point might be two drops. Yeah, yeah. 
that something could bounce off. It of says pod therapy on there someplace, or maybe it just says hefty. I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, We've changed the name of the show. Yeah, it's fine. It just says Nick Tangerman's blanket. Yes. yes. <laughs> so also we got a uh, a wonderful note from uh, one of our new patrons. So one of our new theropods is Grumpy Lake Mead Park Ranger, who wrote this uh, to right. us on Patreon. Quote, if you've ever wondered what the smallest demographic of listener Dr. Jim has insulted on air, (laughs) I I would propose that it is the small but hardworking group of rangers at Lake Mead. In episode 187, they were called good for fucking nothing after Dr. Jim's piracy incident last month. As a former Lake Meter myself, I was initially appalled, but after some careful reflection, I agree with his sentiment. <laughs> was still appalled. <laughs> <laughs> Keep up the good work. That comes from Grumpy Lake Mead Park Ranger. Well, <laughs> see, you can insult them and they come around anyway. Thanks, Grumpy Lake, Lake Mead, Mead Park, Park Ranger. Ranger. I fully support you and your work, and I thank you for your effort. And if you, as a thank you for my support, would like to send me free entry, yeah, 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 to us a park ranger pass, Lake Mead, yeah, send it on over. Just give us your badge for a week. We we'll, can be we'll bought. use it wisely. Yeah, we can be bought absolutely. So thank you to uh, that. Uh, so we have a new therapal who I think Jacob would like to announce. Oh, our newest therapal. I have a therapal that I would now like to recognize. <laughs> Laura. <He is> prepared. <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the ranks of therapal. <laughs> I want to take this opportunity to say Is that a Sitari's holding? That I wholeheartedly <laughs> oh my God, disagree with that? every single negative thing. <laughs> that Nick has ever said about you. Even if he said it in Jacob's voice, which he may have done on many of an occasion. <laughs> Furthermore, I would like to take this opportunity to say that I do not now, nor have I ever considered you to be a Nazi. Yeah, yeah, just so you know. I, uh, I want to double down on I that, I feel too. like I'm the only that one gifts that from both of us. her. Yeah, that gives from both of us. Welcome, I, new Therapal Laura. I'm signing my name on the bottom <laughs> welcome, of this. Welcome, this, this musical card brought to you by Jacob in parentheses, also Jim. I, I would like to sign on to all of these sentiments. Yeah, it's you two who should be worried. You're right. Do you need me to take the fall for this one? I have never said anything oh, negative about Oh, I'm sure more. we can find a few things. <laughs> I could genuinely say right now that I am not concerned. <laughs> yeah. In any way. <laughs> I think you'll be okay. Welcome, Laura C., uh, newest there, pal. Also, bunch of new Therapods, and we want to thank all of our Therapods at the beginning of every month. But first, we want to thank our newbies. Thank you, Grumpy Lake Mead Park Ranger. <laughs> of all the demographics Welcome. Jim has insulted. And thank you, Sarah Olo. Welcome to the party. Welcome, Sarah. And thank Sarah. you, all of our Therapods. Thank you, Dan Martin, Kate Keller, Scoop Stranot, Corey Owens, Linda Brandmeyer, Laurie Eltsroth, Brad Kefauver, Christine Phillips, Joseph Pengrazio, Tracy Replogle, a.k.a. my mom, Gavin Bristow, Carrie Terhark, a.k.a. Nick's sister, Stacy Westerlin, Richard Bruins, Scoopy Scoopy Jess Jess, Ian Whitefall, Chelsea Saracen, Craig Little, Curtis Kiwi Scoop Hanlon, James K., Katie Chiwakowski, Don Dorr, Jim Hunter, Adam Rabiznik, spelled just like it sounds, Brooks Lyle, Oki Scoop, Jeffrey Scoops of War Ackerman, Matthew Nair, Three Scoops a Lady, Elliot H. Lamb, Todd Canfield, David Sorensen, Felicia Butler, Chelsea Lamb, Shayla Bullock, Scopatron, Lori Izzo in the Hizzo, Stacy Coleman, I have the knack, Adam Petanuzzo, Lauren, Matt Lenegren, Heather, Take It Evie, Podcast Sustainable Transportation for All, Ulrica, Ian Soto, Jessica Cyphers, Andrew Langmead, Charlie Quinn Starling, Natalie MC, that Josh guy, Kernapiller, Levante Baggy, Dr. Scoop Little, Mama Ninja Scoop, Colson Morrow, Jacob Harrington, Sean Daughtry, Amanda H., Grumpy Lake Mead Park Ranger, and Sarah Olo. And thank you to all of our Theradactyls. Ice Blue Scoop, Brian Lehman, Scott Brady, Fred Bashara Jr., Andrea Anderson, Lindsay Bashara, Robert Paulson, Tess Miller, Slurpee Kaye, motherfucker. <laughs> 
Frozen, Cusser, Angie, Ellis, Ryan, Stewart, Scott, Ashlock, Robert, Ward, Sapphire, Sammy Scoop, Tori Snyder, Chris, Benjamin Stanley, Sandra McAuflo. <laughs> God damn it. McAuliffe, Sandra McAuliffe. Nail of the it. spelling on that throws me every time. It's the M that Sandra really gets Sandra McAuliffe. Him. That's not what a, how I would if you just said McAuliffe. That's not how I would write it. Yeah, yeah. Submit your complaints to her parents. <laughs> I think it's a lovely name, Sandra. I just it throws me McLaughlin. off every time. In the arms. <laughs> Shut up, McLaughlin. And Cy Schnonigan. You, you fucked that one up too. I did not. <laughs> Shonigan. No, I don't think you so. Said Shnonigan. <laughs> no, we talked the other day. That's how he pronounces it. He and by the way, the reason Laura got pronounced. extra attention, for those who don't know, Laura is Nick's girlfriend. Yeah. Oh, Which is also why this yeah. might yeah. be the last episode you ever hear. It's depending true. upon. One day I'm going to come in the studio. Nick's not going to be here. And yep. I'm just going to get like the, the broken arrow protocol. <laughs> Destroy it all. <laughs> Burn everything. Code seven. <laughs> no survivors. I don't think there's anything that she doesn't know about this show. Yeah, yeah, she's been on. Pretty she's sure also she's... been a guest on the show. She's yeah. been a guest multiple times. Yeah, she, she shows yeah. up like usually a bunch of will, episodes. but yes, <laughs> she's been here a ton <laughs> yeah. of times. She's been in the studio. She's literally studied for exams while sitting in this room. Yeah. So she's she has sat in this room and not listened to us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> she knows the deal. We called her the other day to try to prove how dumb I am about geography. <laughs> yeah. She gets um, roped into this more than she wants to. You use that word tried <laughs> yeah. very liberally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we called her the other day to show Inserted. that you were dumb about geography. <laughs> Demonstrate. Oh, Lord. That episode still hasn't aired yet. And we want to thank our bosses, the Saccharin 16, the mysterious and shrouded Illuminati members of the fan club, the Thera Producers. Thank you, Smitty Scoop, Jake Schneider, Robert Brownie Jr., Mint, Kayla Lansbury, Judy Schneider, Nathan's Hot Dog Scoop, King of Student Loan Debt, Dr. Ben Dawn, Crazy Manana Scoop, Mason Miller, Scott Jameson, Carolyn Albert, Leon Kassab, Kevin Chamberlain, Malaya, Richard Macy, Cindy Ash, Newstick, and first of name, breather of fire, dumb of ass, Lord Colin Stewart, also winner known of the as blankets. winner of Nick's dog blanket. Hey. Congratulations. <laughs> Make sure you spray it for fleas. And if you would like to hear this episode uncut and unedited. I don't know why you wouldn't. <laughs> and enjoy our spontaneous side projects, go to Patreon. Except for Laura. Slash don't therapy. Go there. <laughs> Thank you for supporting 45 Mental minutes Health. of silence, Laura. That's all the time that we've got for this week's session. We want to thank our landlords, Matt and Mattingly's Ice Cream Social Podcast. You're welcome. Which you should check out anywhere you can get podcasts. And thanks to those of you who contributed to our show today. We really appreciate it. Remember, pot therapy isn't something you should keep all to yourself. Share this episode with someone who needs it by opening the episode description in your podcast app and copying and pasting the link we provided into your social media. Don't forget, you can check us out at facebook.com slash pot therapy, on Twitter at pot therapy guys, on Instagram at pot therapy guys, and at patreon.com slash therapy. Do you want to submit a question to the show? Ask anonymously at podtherapy.net or email us at podtherapyguys at gmail.com. I'm Nick Tangent. I'm Sandra McLaughlin. Thanks. And we'll see you for your appointment next week. No, you're baby weasel. <laughs> oh, that poisoned coffee. Now, anyway, getting back to what I was talking about before we started. No, 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 no. I just wanted to say Bye. one simple.